Get ready for unique, rare, and little-known treasures from the golden age of radio. You're listening to The Amazing World of Radio with Adam Graham. Welcome to The Amazing World of Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. You can check out our main podcast, The Great Detectives of Old Time Radio, at greatdetectives.net. If you enjoy the program we provide, you can become one of our Patreon supporters, patreon.greatdetectives.net. And if you do so before the end of March, you can help choose our summer series at patreon.greatdetectives.net. Now it's time for Episode 5 in Orson Welles' adaptation of Les Miserables, the original air date August the 20th of 1937, and this episode is The Grave. So long as these problems are not solved, so long as ignorance and poverty remain on earth, these words cannot be useless. These are the words which preface the fifth of seven broadcasts based on Victor Hugo's great novel, Les Miserables. WOR and the Mutual Network present Orson Welles, distinguished young author, actor, and director in an adaptation of the book which he has created especially for radio. Each episode portrays some development in the progress of Jean Valjean, a role played by Orson Welles, who is also heard as he reads the narrative passages. Les Miserables, part five, the episode which is called The Grave. Hold! 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 Who goes there? Police lieutenant on special duty for Inspector Javert. Any news of Jean Valjean? Have you caught him? Caught him? <laughs> we thought we caught him. Ah, just look. Bright moonlight. Twenty-four of us. A whole street full of police. A blind alley and Javert himself. And would you believe it, lieutenant? He got away. <laughs> I'll bet Javert's boiling. Where is he now? Out in the fields with the first squad. Javert swears he'll find him if it takes every policeman in Paris. He hates that man so much it frightens him. Uh, there's something between those two that's worse than hate. Whatever it was, it happened years ago when Javert was an inspector in some town in the south and this Jean Valjean was the mayor. Valjean, the mayor? Oh, yes. Made his fortune in business, he did. And still has the money somewhere, hidden away. He called himself Monsieur Madeleine in those days. Ah, but you can't fool Javert. Javert found him out and sent him back to the galley ship. The double chain. How did Valjean get out of that? How did he get out of this tonight? And mark you, Lieutenant, this time he had a child with him. Yes. Javert has spoken of that child. Yes. The offspring of some criminal woman, Jean Valjean, protected from Javert when he was mayor. (laughs) It is very sordid. But where did they go? Where could they go? Look about you, Lieutenant. Where is there room for an old man and a little child? What's beyond those walls? Oh, what does it matter? No living man could climb those walls. These things are not to be understood. The convict has vanished, and there's an end to it. And if I know Jean Valjean, he won't be caught. Yes, my friend. But if I know Javert, you'll go on hunting him. Trapped in a closed street, pursued and surrounded, but Jean Valjean had escaped. Javert had found him out in his hiding place and chased him that night across the city of Paris till he came to this blind alley. A squad of police, a lone man, and a little child. Where was this Jean Valjean? No living man could climb those walls. But there are things to be learned in 19 years' service in the galleys. And Jean Valjean had learned in those years the dark sciences of the impossible. Pulling Cosette up after him, he had climbed one of those walls. He found himself in a garden, a wild and solitary place, black in the shadow of an enormous and shuttered building. 
What was this house? Wrapped snugly in his great coat, Cosette, the little child, soon fell asleep. And Jean Valjean, watching over her, knew that night that so long as this child should be alive, he should need nothing except for her and fear nothing save on her account. He heard a strange noise, a sound like a bell shaking on the neck of a beast. There was something in the garden, something limping in the darkness, and like a man. To the outcast, all things are hostile, and all things are suspicious. He distrusts the day because it helps to discover him, and the night because it helps to surprise him. Jean Valjean shuddered because the garden was empty. Now he shuddered because someone was there. There was no hiding in that garden. Ah! Oh, ah! Oh, what is it? Oh, you frightened me. Who are you? A hundred francs if you'll hide me. Oh, oh, God help us. Monsieur Manley. What? Monsieur, monsieur. How did you get here? How? Did you fall from the sky? Who are you? Don't you remember old Fauchelevent? You once saved my life. Fauchelevent? Six years ago, monsieur, you lifted my great wagon from the mud. I was caught there. I would have been crushed, monsieur Manley. Yes, yes. Fauchelevent. The wagoner. And you. You remember only Monsieur Madeleine, the mayor of Montreux. Yes, yes. And what is the mayor doing here? Oh, Savon. I'm in trouble. You must hide me. Oh, not here, Monsieur. No man is allowed here. No one will know. Oh, Monsieur Madeleine, you have arrived at a very good time. I should say very bad. There is one of the sisters dangerously sick. She is dying. Oh, Father. I'm frightened. Of course, that little one. Go back to sleep. There's nothing to be afraid of. Monsieur, why do you wear that bell on your knee? They put it on me, my child, so they know when I'm coming. Fauchelevent, what is this place? Oh, don't you know, Monsieur Madeleine? You sent me here. It was your recommendation that got me the job as gardener, Monsieur. It's a convent. A convent? Yes, Monsieur, the convent of the perpetual adoration and a young lady's school. But how did you get here? Old friend... Let it go that I fell from the sky. Well, I believe it, monsieur. You don't need to tell me. I believe it. God must have taken you into his own hand to have a close look at you and then put you down. Only he meant to put you in a monastery and he made a mistake. Listen, the nun is dead. Oh, father. Shush, Cosette. What is that bell? It is the death knell. That bell will strike every minute for 24 hours until the body goes out of the church. You hear it? It's like I told you, a stroke every minute. It is the rule of the convent. Fauchelevent, what do you do here? I am the gardener, monsieur. A gardener? Of course. Fauchelevent, I'm in danger. Oh. Will you save my life? Oh, ask me anything on earth. Give me a job. A job, Monsieur Madeleine? You, the mayor of Montreal? Forget Monsieur Madeleine. I must have a job. I must stay here. No one must see me. Don't you see? This convent would save us. Oh, but the little girl, Monsieur. Cosette shall be entered into the school. Please, old friend, make me your assistant in the garden. Present me as your brother. The Reverend Mother might consent. But there, there is one thing. You see, monsieur, the gates are locked. The mother, the mother prioress will want to know how you got into the garden. And monsieur, I won't be able to tell her. What do you mean? You can't enter the convent from here, monsieur. They must admit you from the street. From the street? No. No, there, there must be some other way. Oh, no, there is no other way. And here's the difficulty. The porter, not me, unlocks the gate. In order for you to come in, it is necessary that you should get out. For me, you have fallen from heaven because I know you. But for the nuns, you must come in at the door. I see. For the child, it would be easy. I have my door, which opens to the court. I knock, the porter opens. I have my basket on my back. The little girl is inside. I go out. It's all very simple, monsieur. Very simple, monsieur, Madeline, except for you. Well, can't you smuggle me out some way? Like Cosette? Undercover? It's not possible, monsieur. Oh, oh. <laughs> There's a bell for me. It's the Reverend Mother. She wants to see me. I wonder why. 
Monsieur Madeleine, don't stir from this shed. It's worth your life. I'm coming. I'm coming. Wait a moment. Reverend Mother, you sent for me? Reverend Mother? At a quarter to nine in the morning, and at all hours, praise and adoration to the most holy sacrament of the altar. Monsieur Fauchelevent, I have called you. I am here, Reverend Mother. I wish to speak to you. And for my part, I have nothing to say to the most Reverend Mother, uh, but something. You have a communication you wish to make to me. Reverend Mother, I am not young. No, monsieur. No, Reverend Mother. And I have also a brother who is not young. Indeed, monsieur. Not young and not old. An excellent gardener, honest and respectable, and the father of a little girl who would be reared under God in this house and may someday be a nun. Monsieur Fauchelevent, can you, between now and night, procure an iron bar? For what work? To be used as a lever. Oh, yes, Reverend Mother. And may I say further that I have served here in the convent too long with this bell on my knee not to have an excellent brother. Monsieur Fauchelevent, we have confidence in you. You know that a mother died here this morning. Yes, Reverend Mother, amen. It is Mother Crucifixion, one of the blessed. Yes, Reverend Mother, and now she's dead. At nine o'clock in the morning and at all hours, Praise and adoration to the most holy sacrament of the altar. Amen. Mother Crucifixion will be buried in the coffin in which she slept for 20 years. Yes, I will nail her up then and we'll put aside the undertaker's coffin. The four mother choristers will help you. Well, to nail up the coffin, I don't need them. No. To let it down. Where? Under the altar. Oh, the vault under the altar? We must obey the dead. To be buried in the vault under the altar, the altar of the chapel, not to go into profane ground, to remain in death where she prayed in life, that was the last request of Mother Crucifixion. She asked for it. But it's forbidden. Forbidden by men and joined by God. If it should come to be known. We have confidence in you. But Reverend Mother is the agent of the health commission. God subordinated to the commissary of police. Such is the case. Is it settled? It is settled, but I limp. I need help. To limp is not a crime, and it may be a blessing. Monsieur Fauchelevent, I am satisfied with you. Tomorrow, after the burial, bring your brother to me. Yes, Reverend Mother. And his daughter also. We will admit her to the school. At 9.15 in the morning and at all hours, Praise and adoration to the most holy sacrament of the altar. Uh, so you see, Monsieur Madeleine, that's that's the only thing wrong with the whole idea. The government coffin. <laughs> Government coffin. The coffin from the administration. You see, Monsieur Madeleine, when a nun dies, the municipality physicians uh, come and say, there is a nun dead. The government sends us a coffin, and the next day a hearse and some bearers to take it to the cemetery. The bearers will come tomorrow, and there'll be nothing in the coffin. Put something in it. A dead body? I have none. Put me in the coffin. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Monsieur Madeleine, put you in the coffin. <laughs> I've got to get out of here. And I mustn't be seen. But, Monsieur, is it possible? Suppose you should sneeze. First of all, I must decide now either to be taken here or to go out in that hearse. There's only one thing that worries me. What will be done at the cemetery? Oh, I could handle the grave digger. He's a drunkard and a very close friend of mine by the name of Mestier. If he's not drunk tomorrow, I'll make him drunk and do his work for him. And when he goes away, I'll pull you out of the hole. That's simple. Then it's settled. All goes well. I get out of my coffin. And you get me out of my grave. Buried alive. Jean Valjean had arranged his coffin so he could live in it and breathe a very little. 
He was calm. He counted on that drunken gravedigger, old Foslevar's friend, the gravedigger, Mestien. The plans were perfect. They would take him in the coffin to the graveyard, thinking he was the nun. The priests would read the services and go away. Then Fauchelevent would take this Mestien to a tavern, and Jean Valjean would be left in the grave. He would wait patiently. Then Fauchelevent would return, alone, and he would be released. He was confident of the result. The four boards of the coffin exhaled a kind of terrible peace. It was as if something of the repose of the dead had entered into the tranquility of Jean Valjean. Jean Valjean felt himself lifted by the pallbearers. He felt himself thrown into the hearse. He felt it start. He felt himself driven from the clattering pavement of the streets to the hard ground of the boulevard, out to the open country and the grave. The boards of his coffin were thin, and Jean Valjean, lying there, could hear clearly what was spoken above him. Pull up! Pull up! Rain in, driver, let me on! Who are you? I'm the grave digger. The, the grave digger? You? The grave digger, me. Let me on. The grave digger is Father Messiaen. The grave digger was Messiaen. He is dead. I am the grave digger. I tell you the grave digger is Father Messiaen. After Napoleon Louis XVIII. After Messiaen, Gribier. Peasant, my name is Gribier. Oh, so Messiaen is dead, is he? Oh, uh, let's uh, go have a drink. I never drink. Comrade, uh, I am the grave digger of the convent. My colleague, I salute you. Uh, let's uh, have a drink. I have studied. I have graduated. I never drink. Uh, <coughs> Comrade grave digger, we must uh, make each other's acquaintance. It is made. You are a peasant. I am a Parisian. Yes, I, uh, I don't think you know, my comrade, how important it is that we know each other very well. Oh, very well indeed, comrade. Over a glass of something's wrong. I have told you, peasants, I never drink. Please, comrade grave digger. I ought not to be a grave digger. I was intended for literature. Indeed, peasants, I am still a public scribe. You are not the grave digger? One does not prevent the other, peasants. I accumulate. Good. Uh, let's uh, have a drink. Let's have a drink. Let's have a drink. Ding dong, ding dong, liquor, liquor. Have you no other topic of conversation? I'm a superior man, peasants. By day, I am a letter writer. I am the scribe of our most prominent bakers and cooks. In the morning, I write love letters. In the evening, I dig graves. Such is life. Uh, just one little good strong drink. Business first. What? Here we are at the graveyard. Here is the good priest and his choir boy waiting for the performance of the last rite. And here is my beautiful fresh grave. Come, peasants, lend a hand with this cough. Every word. Clearly. Jean Valjean could hear clearly what was spoken above him. Jean Valjean heard suddenly a sound above his head which seemed to him like a clap of thunder. It fell on the coffin lid over his face. It was earth, earth from a spade. Four inches from his face, they were burying him. It stopped up the air holes. He couldn't breathe. I said he 
drive away. I stole his grave digger's card and sent him home after it. <laughs> You're safe. I fooled that Gribier, Monsieur Manley. Monsieur Manley? Monsieur Manley? Monsieur Manley! Why don't you answer me? What's wrong with you, Monsieur Manley? I'll get you out of that. Monsieur Manley? Monsieur Manley? Monsieur Manley? Are you alive? Monsieur Manley? He's dead. He's dead. He's suffocated. Monsieur Manley? Oh, what shall I do? What shall I do? This little girl, what shall I do with her? Oh, Monsieur Madeleine, the best man that God ever made, Monsieur Madeleine. Monsieur Madeleine, Your Honor. Monsieur Madeleine? Uh, he doesn't hear me. He's dead. Ah, don't open your eyes! Oh, ah, I can't get it! Don't open your eyes at me! Oh, 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 what's wrong with you? Oh, oh, oh. Aren't you dead? I thought you were dead. So did I. Don't open your eyes at me if you're dead. I can't stand it. Most of ah, all. Out of the clouds and up from the dead. I can't stand it. Dear old I... friend. Oh. <laughs> uh, just a minute. I'll be myself again. Did you faint, monsieur? Can you breathe again? Dear old friend, we must go get corsets and take her to the convent. <laughs> Most of all. <laughs> uh, uh, just give me time. I'm old, but I'll get used to it. You can get used to anything, but oh my God, out of the sky and the grave in the same day, down from the cloud and up from the dead, oh my God, I can't stand it, I can't stand it. Inspector of police watched the street where the convict, Jean Valjean, had disappeared. A hearse came out of the convent and passed Javert on its way to the cemetery. An old gardener came out of the convent and passed Javert carrying a covered basket. This gardener returned to the convent with another old man and a little child. He passed Javert in a carriage. For three months, Inspector Javert watched that street, and then he went away. In the convent, all was peace. The community was grateful for the services of its gardener. His niece was admitted to the school, and his brother was given a post as his assistant. So all went well for Jean Valjean. The years passed by. Cosette growing up in the school. Jean Valjean close to her in the convent garden and watching her as she grew. And so she grew. No, they get marvelous. When Cosette was 14, Jean Valjean withdrew her from the convent school. He took a little house for her in the outskirts of the city, and they lived there together, very quietly. Perhaps the police had forgotten Jean Valjean. Perhaps Javert had stopped watching. You have an interesting story, monsieur. Now, what is your name again? This is simply for the record. Marius. Marius Pontmercy. Age? Twenty. Occupation? I'm a student. When did you meet this girl, Cosette? And why have you come here to the police? I saw her first three years ago in the Luxembourg. She used to walk there with the old gentleman, her guardian. And I've come to you because she's disappeared. Is the house empty where this couple lived? Deserted. You've searched for them and inquired after them diligently... And their whereabouts are unknown. What do you suspect? Well, I don't know. The old gentleman was eccentric. Explain yourself. Well, he kept strangely to himself. He never left the house except at nightfall. It was almost as though... Well, 
as though we were hiding from someone. And the girl, Cosette? She is quiet, monsieur, but very beautiful. I see. When you last saw this Cosette, did she speak to you of anything untoward? Can you remember any circumstance who struck you as peculiar? Yes, monsieur. The old gentleman seemed frightened. Frightened of what? Well, I... I can't explain it, monsieur. There was a man. A man Cosette had seen, or, or thought she'd seen, standing on the edge of the garden. The old gentleman seemed to be frightened of that man. Did you see this man? I don't know. I saw a shadow. If it was a man, he was big like yourself, monsieur. And I don't know how he got there or how he moved so quietly. Cosette said that he wore a long gray coat and a, and a fat hat and carried a stick. I remember her telling Monsieur Fauchelevent. Is that what he calls himself? What did you say, Monsieur? Hmm? Uh, nothing. How long afterward did they disappear? Why, they must have left that night, Monsieur, when I'd gone home. It's, it's five weeks now since I've seen her. Monsieur Marius. Don't trouble yourself any further. Your loved one shall be returned to you. I will look for that girl, and I will look for that man. I will look very carefully for that man, and I will find him. If you hear anything else, please notify me at once, here at police headquarters. My name is Javert. Good day, monsieur. <laughs> W.O.R. and the Mutual Network have brought you part five of Victor Hugo's absorbing masterpiece, Les Miserables, the episode which was called The Grave. Orson Welles, distinguished young author, actor, and director, played the role of Jean Valjean and was also heard reading the narrative passages. Assisting Mr. Wells were Martin Gable as Javert, Ray Collins as Fauchelevent, William Johnstone as Marius, Peggy Allenby, Virginia Wells, Estelle Levy, Hiram Sherman, and Everett Sloan. Next Friday evening at 9.30 o'clock, Eastern Daylight Saving Time, we shall present Les Miserables in its sixth phase, the episode which is called The Barricade. is the Coast to Coast Network of the Mutual Broadcasting System. Welcome back. It's important to remember that an adapter has incredible power through the choices they make. Uh, when it comes to Les Miserables, the actual book, if you went and purchased a paperback copy of this uh, story, would be 1,488 pages long. Even given seven half-hour episodes, there is no way that you can capture all of that in a dramatization. And uh, the adapter really shapes the story that we hear by what they choose to include and what they don't include. It's worth noting, for example, that the incidents in today's episodes really aren't included in, for example, the stage musical version. Wells' choice to include these particular scenes is interesting. I think what he was trying to do here, and I, and I think it works, is that he was trying to have an episode that was a bit lighter in tone. The first four episodes of this series have been very heavy and have had just a lot of real emotionally gritty uh, moments. 
And I think there, Wells had a sense that you needed to break this up a little bit. You didn't want to exhaust your audience. So you get a much lighter episode with some opportunities for a bit of comic relief and not as heavy a plot. Of course, as this is Les Miserables, even a lighter episode with comedy involves our hero getting buried alive. But this was still a nice respite that sets us up for the last two episodes uh, with the ending bit. Well, we turn now to listener comments and feedback, and Stephen had a question after episode two. I'm confused about a plot point. Why is Valjean wanted by the police? In the first episode, he was released from jail. He's an ex-convict, but not wanted by the police. The bishop gives him the silver, so he is not wanted for that. What is he wanted for? It feels that Javert pursues Valjean simply for being a former convict, which is far from justice. Well, it was a little confused, but uh, towards the end of the first episode, Valjean runs into a boy who uh, drops a penny. And uh, Valjean, in the book, he puts his foot on it just out of habit, you know, of scrapping and taking everything for himself. And then he realizes that he's reformed and he runs after the boy, but the boy is just scared and uh, Valjean can't catch him to return the penny. So he is wanted for the robbery of the penny. And then, uh, essentially, it's the fact that he... Uh, went ahead and assumed a new name, and he stopped using the passport he had been issued. Uh, because if you remember, as you listen to the first episode, Valjean has the prisoner passport, but essentially it means nobody in their right mind is going to take him in. And so to start a new life, he discards his passport. And uh, that is also against the law. So those were his two major offenses. As to why Javert hunts Valjean, it's, um, it's, I think, a complex question. In many ways, I think you, you can look at Javert as not so much of a person as much as an embodiment of just a pure legalism. He is obsessed with Valjean almost uh, to an absurd degree. Well, yeah, to an absurd degree. I mean, could you imagine a police inspector spending a quarter of a year watching a street because he's hoping to catch sight of a guy who robbed a penny and broke his uh, parole? I mean, even in France of the 19th century, your superior is going to tell you, let it go. But Valjean's obsession truly, I think, compels him. And I think there are reasons for that and what that represents. We'll discuss in the next uh, couple episodes. But it's definitely just an incredibly obsessed quest. All right. Well, that will do it for today. Join us back here next week for part six. If you do have a comment, send it to us, box13 at greatdetectives.net. And check out our main podcast, Great Detectives of Old Time Radio, greatdetectives.net from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.